You're familiar with my work, psychohistory? Every mathematician has read your theory. It's not a theory. It's the future of mankind expressed in numbers. Hey guys, Pete here. Today I'm going to do one more foundation video before the first season premieres on September 24th. I'm going to look at the history of Isaac Asimov's book series and the way the TV show might change things in its adaptation. After watching and breaking down all the teasers and trailers, it does seem that the show will have a different feel, but that might not be a bad thing. Before we jump in, there will be some light spoilers as to what the story's about, so this is your chance to leave if you were planning to go in cold. With that out of the way, let's get started. Apple TV's Foundation is based on the seven novel series of the same name by Isaac Asimov. It was first published as a series of eight stories in Astounding Magazine from 1942 through 1950. Then those were collected and published as three novels from 1951 through 1953. After writing Foundation stories for almost a decade, Asimov got tired of the series and moved on to other things. And that was it for 30 years. It was a trilogy made up of the books Foundation, Foundation and Empire, and Second Foundation. The series was well received if not commercially successful. In 1966 at the World Science Fiction Convention, it was the winner in the one-time Hugo Award, Best All-Time Series, beating out The Lord of the Rings, and from there it continued to gain popularity as more people discovered it, solidifying its status as a classic for a really important period in sci-fi. By 1981, Asimov's fans and publishers had been pressuring him to revisit the series for decades. And politely, he'd been telling them no. In that year, the publishers decided to entice him with an advance worth 10 times his normal rate. And he agreed to write his first Foundation story in 32 years. He continued where he left off writing two sequels, Foundation's Edge and Foundation and Earth, both of which debuted on the New York Times bestseller list. He also revisited the Robot series at this time, deciding to connect his two most popular sci-fi series. After he finished Foundation and Earth, he was unsure how he wanted to finish the Foundation story, so he went back and wrote two prequels, Prelude the Foundation and Forward the Foundation providing an in-depth backstory for Harry Seldon and fleshing out what life was like in the Empire before the fall for people on Trantor. Unfortunately, Asimov died in 1992 after completing Forward, so when that was released in 1993, it became the last installment in the series. Foundation is about the work of the mathematician Harry Seldon. He developed a statistical process that can predict future events on the societal level. In that work, he discovers that the Galactic Empire is in the process of collapsing, and that's going to be the beginning of a 30,000 year period of chaos until the next empire rises. Essentially, it's too late to stop that. It's already been going on for too long, but he believes he can shorten the period of time between the empires to just 1,000 years. He creates the foundation to guide things and to develop the Second Galactic Empire. Asimov came up with this idea when he was 21 years old, and he pitched the idea of a future history of the fall of an empire on the galactic scale. Astounding Stories editor John Campbell convinced him to make it an ongoing series, lasting a thousand years to include the rise of the Second Empire. This opens the story up for a lot more opportunities, as the characters can look at the past and look at human nature as a way of navigating themselves through the process of creating something new. Psychohistory is the hook, but including a plan that solves the central problem scientifically means that he had to come up with different ways to keep things interesting. No one who has power wants to let go of it, and the math is so complicated that no one can actually verify it. The ruling class, which I'll come back to, have an interest in not believing in Selden's warnings, and his decades worth of work is legitimately difficult for them to understand. Also, psychohistory can't predict the future of an individual or what they might do. So overall, no individual is all that important over the course of the story, but in predicting these trends or events that will affect everyone, Selden does anticipate a series of crises that will occur. In those periods, individuals will have to rise to the occasion in order for the foundation to continue. To add another layer, psychohistory won't work if people know what's going to happen. After all, if they did, they might change their behavior, and that would throw everything off. So Harry's able to predict the inevitable crises, but can't prepare the Foundation to face them. 
It comes down to what amounts to a series of puzzles, and personalities emerge at the right time to assess the situation and often do more than just follow the plan. With its storied history and such a captivating idea behind it, you might be wondering why you've never seen a screen adaptation of the Foundation series. Part of the problem is the scope. He set out to write a story that was going to last a thousand years. This means that decades pass in between each of the opening stories, introducing a new cast of characters in each new installment. It's part of the appeal of the books in that it allows the author to show the different stages of development of the new empire, but it doesn't naturally lend itself to the format of television shows where characters are developed over a multi-season series. For an example, Harry Seldon is only alive in the first 28 pages of the first book in the series. He'd been working on psychohistory for 40 years, so he's up there in age, and the next story occurs 50 years later, after the Foundation was established. So his influence is driving the story, his plan is basically the main character, but he's no longer actively involved. Since 1998, different studios tried to adapt the story first as a movie and then later as a TV show, but nothing panned out until now. All that's to say that a close adaptation isn't likely. You could make the argument that it would be ill-advised considering the challenges, and after seeing the trailers, it seems like the series will be its own thing. Based on the casting, there are some obvious changes in the gender of some of the characters that are introduced early. Edo Demerzel, Salvor Hardin, and Gal Dornick are all women in the show. For Salvor and Gal, which I think they actually changed to be pronounced Gale, this doesn't really change much considering what they do in the story. It seems like just a way to introduce some female characters early, since the first book doesn't have any to speak of. Demerzel is more intriguing because this is a character who has a connection to the Emperor Cleon I, but in the books he was already dead by the time Gale arrived on Trantor. I can't really get into that character without spoilers, but Cleon is the next big change we know about. In the second teaser they revealed that there are clones of Cleon that make up a genetic dynasty. There are three of them at different ages at any given time sharing a triple throne. Brother Dawn, Brother Day, and Brother Dusk from the youngest to oldest. This and some of the other changes we'll discuss are an effort to keep some characters in the story across multiple seasons. It's towards the point I made earlier, the TV watching audience wants characters to be invested in. If you're changing things up multiple times, it becomes difficult to follow and it's hard to care about what happens to characters if you know they aren't sticking around. The showrunner has said in interviews that they came up with ways to have around six characters stick around through the centuries for that reason, and we'll see how that plays out. The genetic dynasty might be a welcome addition, and it doesn't hurt to have an actor like Lee Pace on the roster. We get a glimpse of how that might develop with the casting of Brother Dawn. There are two different actors for the role, one very young, which means that different scenarios of their ascension to the middle throne as Brother Day can be covered. That could also work to fill in the time between stories. The first two stories in the series cover Gale's arrival on Trantor and the beginning of the foundation on a planet in the periphery of the Empire called Terminus. Gale meets with Harry Seldon, and as far as what we've seen, the show seems to be sticking pretty closely to Harry's character. This is a good sign considering his plan in Psycho History is the backbone of everything. It appears they're going to be giving Gale a lot more to do, and perhaps using her backstory as a way to do some world building. She's from a small planet where life is much different than it is for someone who grew up in the capital. From the trailers, we can see that she's going to have a relationship with another character who wasn't originally around in this part of the story. Rach is a character that Harry meets in the prequels when he's still a kid, and he ends up adopting him. Because of the time that passes in the prequels, he's already grown and had a family and ends up dying off-planet before we get to the beginning of the original trilogy. Salvor Hardin is born on Terminus and grows to adulthood as a member of the Foundation. This is my favorite character in the first book, and the one that highlights the strengths of the structure of what Asimov was going for. Most of the Terminus scenes in the trailers appear to diverge quite a bit from the original story, and I just hope the show's able to reproduce the same effect at the reveal of the first crisis the book pulled off. This is what originally hooked me into the story, and this was actually the first short story that was published. 
In relation to Salver, the last thing we know for sure that's different is the vault. In the show, the vault is this mysterious hovering structure that was already on Terminus when they arrived. According to the showrunner, no one knows what it is because it's surrounded by a null field that keeps everyone away. Everyone except Salver, who they say has a special relationship with it. The vault does exist in the books, and it's important as things progress, but there's no resemblance to what we've seen in the trailers. So for now, we'll just leave it at that. To wrap things up, for me, the best parts of the story are how the Foundation adapts in the process of building up its power. Also, the different stages it goes through that resemble emerging empires from our history. It all makes sense because it's all human, although it's humans that have colonized the galaxy and can hop between planets. There are a lot of great twists considering the population have no idea what the plan is. And at least in the book, Harry doesn't train or install any psychohistorians with the original group on Terminus. That gave Asimov a clean slate to present situations and introduce personalities that have to come up with solutions when they're facing the different crises. It's a nice setup, it's a story that's got good bones, and there's a lot of potential for this to become a good TV series. And it's a somewhat unique situation where you wouldn't actually want them to do a one-to-one -one adaptation. As a sci-fi series, it's certainly influential. Most of the things you like, the people that made them read Foundation. And once you get into it, you do see its influence all throughout sci-fi. I think that's a good place to leave it. I'm excited to see it. I hope they'll be able to hit those things that make Foundation great, even if they get there in a different way. I'm curious to hear what you think, so let me know in the comments. And please like this video if you enjoyed it. Please subscribe to my channel if you haven't already. Thanks for watching. I'll talk to you soon.